to the Dev Morning Show at Night. I am so excited to be here with you today. My name is Cassidy Williams, and I am here with my wonderful, delightful co-host, Zach. Hey, Zach. Hey, Cass. Are you playing any interesting board games right now? I just got the expansion for Wingspan, the Asia expansion, the brand new one, and I'm very, Ooh. very excited about it. Adds a lot of cool elements to the game. What about Love you? that. I'm... Uh, we, we played a game called uh, Welcome to Your New Home, which is apparently Daniel Radcliffe's favorite board game. So, oh, yeah, it's I fun. haven't heard of that <laughs> one. Well, speaking of awesome games and cool people, uh, we are joined by Jerry Ellsworth today. She is the CEO and co-founder of Tilt 5. Jerry, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's amazing to be here. Yeah, I would love to know what's your favorite board game right now. Um, I just went through a um, couple rounds of uh, Gloomhaven. That was pretty Ooh, funny. Um, yeah. After I unpacked the, uh, after we, I don't want to take all the credit for it. We unpacked the uh, 20 pounds of pieces and punched them all out. Gosh. Pretty phenomenal. Oh, though. Word. <laughs> yeah. It's, a, it's an amazing one, but that's one where you got to have like a dedicated group of people who are willing to go through the whole thing, but it's a cool game. Yeah, yeah. We only made it through a couple times on a, a couple of the uh, the rounds, and then we all got busy, and so it's it's still kind of just sitting there, queued up, ready to go. It's it's here in the office. Ooh, oh well, that's even that's fun too if you have it here in the office, because then you can play it with your teammates and stuff too. Of course, I have yeah. my pandemic <laughs> legacy that we got about eighty percent of the way through, and then the pandemic hit, and it's been uh, <laughs> sitting there. <laughs> it's too <laughs> needing real. to be. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah that was what happened actually with my original gloomhaven group where we started playing regularly and then pandemic hit and it happens <laughs> well we have a piece of technology that can help with that so yes and i'd love for you to tell us about it what are you working on right now tell us about tilt five so till five, uh, we when we founded the company, um, we wanted to do an AR headset that presents holograms on the table for group environments. And so uh, we did a lot of thinking about what's the direction we should go with when we design this hardware. And we did a lot of thinking about it. You know, should we go after education or productivity tools? And uh, my co-founder is a huge um, D&D player, so he was influenced by mm. that. I'm a huge video game player. I worked in the video game uh, industry for quite a few years. And so it was a natural direction for us to focus our product on an AR headset and all the peripherals that go with it that are focused on games where you can come together as a group. You see these holograms pop out of the table. All these game characters are running all over the place and you can directly interact with them. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, uh, we've been at it for a little over five years. We just started shipping our first product uh, four or five months ago. Uh, it's been getting really great reviews. Um, so it's been great to have that focus on like a little nice um, niche that we can optimize for. And, and board games is a big too. part of it because since it's tabletop, it lends itself naturally to a uh, reimagination of existing board games. We just announced mm. Catan a month or so ago. So, oh. yeah, yeah, that's, that's I've been so I've been uh, looking at internal builds of a couple of board games that we're producing, and it's really really cool. You know, board games have some friction to it, right? You know, yeah, your friends have to be in the same room. You have to learn the rules. Um, when it's dinner time, you either have to take it off the table or you have to eat your dinner at the couch and you can't leave it set up for weeks unless you're really hardcore. You know, if the game, go like Gloomhaven, like you kind of need to leave that. But with our system, what's really neat is, uh, you know, it has built-in tutorials. It has the magic of all of the uh, game characters actually moving and you can directly interact with them. Your friends can log in from anywhere in the world and join in. So we take away That's all that so friction. Fun. And when dinner time rolls around, oh. you just hit the save button, roll up the game board and then have dinner. And then if you want to come back after dinner, great. Or, you know, a week later you can. Um, so yeah, board games really lend themselves well to our system because um, it's so relatable. Even non-video game players understand what it's like uh, when you use our system. And then our system's also great for video games, which is my favorite thing to do is play action games. 
you know, mm. co-op action yes. games on the system. <laughs> yeah. That, that's so exciting for me because one thing that I did a lot in the pandemic, because again, it, it happened, was I would play things like tabletop simulator. So we could play board games, but mm. remotely. And now that we're more in person now, we'll play a game like Feast for Odin, for example. That has a lot of parts. And so in between rounds, there's so much resetting to make sure that it's all back in the in the right place and then you can go again. And so something like that where you can have the joy of physical gaming, but less of that reset is very Yeah, on the fun. next game that we're going to announce, um, I just had this magic moment uh, when we were kind of alpha testing it where we were all sitting around the table and because it was in the early days of development, the cards and all of um, your private information wasn't private between the players oh. yet. So, you know, our system, since everyone wears a headset, sits around the table, you can have private information between each player. But because it was early, we didn't have that feature in there yet. And so as, you know, one of the programmers here in the office was onboarding me to the game who had played it before you know he was pointing to my cards and saying like well you need to do this objective and you know mm -hmm. you want to click this icon and drag it over here and that's going to do this or that the onboarding experience was like amazing and as soon as we got the um, build of the the game that didn't have the kind of open hand mode where you could see everything I'm like not as much fun not as easy mm -hmm. to onboard mm -hmm. people. So I went back to the, the team and I'm like, we have to have an open hand mode because it's just so nice to play that way. You know, your first couple of times through it where right. private information doesn't matter. It's kind of like how mm -hmm. you learn a game the first time. So we added that feature and we've been demoing it at various trade shows. And it is so easy to get people into, into that board game. Uh, whereas it would be really difficult otherwise. That is so cool. And yeah, perfect for learning a game. And like, granted, you might not want to see everyone's cards while you're playing for the first time or, or, or for the 10th time or whatever. But mm -hmm. when you're learning it, that's that's so cool. I'm geeking out about yeah. it. And what's neat about our system is I have one here. Sorry if I'm going too long on touting up our system, no, but these oh. are the glasses. They're just super lightweight, small. Um, any of you that are into like XR, VR type things, it's got the widest field of view in the, the market for AR. So it's 110 degrees, oh. which means your wow. whole table is just filled with the gaming experience. And then we have our magic wand that goes with it too, which allows you to... <sighs> point at things it has a trigger it's really intuitive for our wow. people that have never used a, a game controller before and then it, you can also hold it sideways so it's like a nintendo controller oh, so you can play pure video games as well and uh it's super low cost so since we focused on video games and board games primarily we were able to optimize what we put in it like we're not trying to be a productivity tool Sure. You know, we don't have to have like all the sensors that they need to walk around the world. We just have, you know, just enough to do kind of tabletop group experiences. So it's, you know, the first system that you buy in the kit's three fifty nine, and then every other pair of glasses afterwards is three hundred dollars. So it's truly at a consumer price point. That's amazing. I want it. <laughs> you, <laughs> you can get it this. now. <laughs> you know, we uh, we started shipping. Um, we started shipping them maybe four months ago, and we were we did a Kickstarter campaign to launch the product uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, we were the largest ever AR project on Kickstarter, which was really awesome. So I think that's just, how wow. I first heard about it, actually. Oh yeah, yeah. From yeah. Seeing, seeing it as a popular Kickstarter thing, yeah. Before we started the the conversation, we were talking about fundraising and things like that. Uh, the reason we did the Kickstarter was we had to prove that there was like an interest, a market fit in the world for this thing. And our mm. investors were like, we're not going to give you any more money unless you go out and prove to us that, you know, people mm. in the world want it. And uh, we didn't have, we were just tiny at the time. We were very little money into the company. We had a prototype that worked and uh, we, we kind of put all the cash in our bank, which was not much as for marketing. And it just blew up on its own, which was really amazing. Wow. Awesome. But um yeah, so we, we got the product into development through the pandemic, which was really challenging to actually bring up a factory where you couldn't even step into the factory. Gosh. So we've never stepped foot into the factory. 
um, which it, wow. my my for background is product. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my background in uh, um, a new product introduction is uh, you know, you're always in the the factory bringing it up, and so we had to learn all new things. Anyway, so we started producing the units, and uh, we had left a pre-sale pre-order button on our website. We were massively back ordered. And as soon as people got their system, started talking about it, we started getting more sales. But what's exciting is we're about this next shipment that comes in in about two weeks, you're going to be able to go to our website and click buy now and get it within like days, which we've been pushing so hard with the factory, like build more, build more. And we got to get to the point where you can just buy it and get it. Yeah. Oh, the, that's always Although I'm not even confident that our I'm not confident our current order is going to last. I keep looking at the numbers and it keeps going down, which is uh, really exciting. Maybe by the time this episode airs, it'll be just wildly popular and everyone will be buying. It. <laughs> of course, of course. Well, I think now is a great time to uh, throw it over to our awesome sponsors, Launch Darkly. The Dev Morning Show at Night is a sponsored podcast. I mean, someone has to pay the bills around here. We're sponsored by Launch Darkly. And LaunchDarkly is the first scalable feature management platform. That means dev teams can innovate and get better software to customers faster. How? By gradually releasing new software features and shipping code whenever they want, fast tracking their journeys to the cloud, and building stronger relationships with business teams. Thanks for the money, LaunchDarkly. Thanks, Launch Darkly. Wow, money's cool. Anyway, <laughs> Jerry, because you have a, a smaller team but such a popular product as, as CEO, what does your day-to-day -day look like? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so my background, for the last 20 years, I've been an engineer, so working on products. And in the early days of the company, I was acti actively involved in like tons of the hardware aspects and that's transitioned recently uh, as the company's grown, we start shipping the product. You know, I spend a lot of time fundraising. So, mm. you know, yeah. as one of that's... our advisors put it, a, uh, a startup doesn't fail because its product is bad or, or uh, its team isn't good enough. It only fails because it runs out of money. And mm. so uh, my job primarily is to constantly raise money and, um, it's a, a new skill I've had to learn. Um, but when I do get a chance, I, um, I do follow one of our other advisors' uh, recommendations. He says, your job now, besides being cash extraction officer, is, <laughs> is to um, be nose in, fingers out, which I think is great. Um, mm. And I try to live by that. So you know, I, I circulate through, talk to the team and I, you know, since my background, I, I can help out at times, but I try to keep my fingers out of, of what they're doing because, you know, I don't have as much time to dedicate to it. Um, our team is really amazing. And of course, every founder says that, but such a small team, uh, we were able to make a profitable hardware product, you know, on, you know, just a fraction of the money that any of the other players in this space, you know, has spent. It, it just baffles me. I look at hundreds of millions of dollars going into um, startups and they don't even deliver a product. And we did this yeah. all on just a, yeah. <laughs> on almost nothing. But it, it, it goes again back to the team. Like I was able to go, my co-founder and I were cherry picked like the best people we worked with in the past and we all came together. And it's such an exciting product that it was pretty easy to recruit um, people that got excited about it and and want to, you know, impact the world in such a positive way. Yeah, that transition yeah. to like fingers out and nose in and stuff is challenging because it, it, especially when the product is so cool. But uh, I worked in so it's... many startups where the founders just couldn't uh, do that, and it's mm. never a good thing, you know, as you start to scale up because. You know, you can't micromanage everything in the company. You have to have really right. great people around you and trust them yeah. that they do the right thing, but validate that they are. Right. Yeah. And and it's 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 fun to dabble, but you don't want to end up just causing more work for your people too. <laughs> I'm our software team's worst nightmare. So whenever a new SDK <laughs> comes out, you know, I'm one of the first to like grab it 
and start to dog food it. So, you know, we have a Unity and Unreal SDK, um, which mm. is amazing, by the way. Um, check it out. It's it's so easy to use our product. You know, we have real-time editing, so you can actually wear the glasses oh, and edit cool. your project in real time. <laughs> it's probably a first in the industry. And uh, But anyway, I grab it, and I'm... I come from a hardware background. I was a chip designer. I've done consumer products. You know, I was never a programmer, so I'm terrible at it. So, but I like I like making things for our system. It's just my fun thing to do on the weekends. So I'll take the SDK and I'll write the worst code and I'll break it. And then I'll come back <laughs> in and I'll be like, you know, I did this thing. I passed an integer like, into Why? here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, they, they look at my code and they're always like, Oh, Jerry. Oh, gosh, what, are you, what did you do? And I'm like, but that kind of makes you the perfect QA tester. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. We never expected anyone to do that. <laughs> it happens all the time. you got like a little halo going and you're just like, oops, oops I built something <laughs> with it. <laughs> well, beyond, you know, like the hardware projects and, you know, the SDKs and stuff that you're playing with, what other tools do you use kind of on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, tools, you know, um, so I designed a lot of the optics in our system, so I still get mm. to, to use optics tools. Um, mm. So those are really fun. You know, my I'm, I'm self-taught everything I've done up to this point. I never went to school to be an engineer, so I taught myself electrical engineering and chip design cool. and how to design products. Awesome. And so uh, when I started working on XR devices, I didn't know much about optics. I just had read some stuff about it. So I just dove in head first and started playing with the tools, started to understand kind of like how the different pieces work together. And um, now... You know, I've gotten quite good at uh, doing optical design. So we're always looking at like, you know, what are we going to do in the next couple of years for product? So that's kind of my pet project as far as like kind of hardcore tools. Um, so I'm, I'm doing optical designs and thinking about like, you know, what's a 2024, 2025 product look like? Mm -hmm. um, on a personal level, um, I do all kinds of things. I still do a lot of chip design type work with FPGAs. So I do use a lot of Verilog synthesis tools. Ooh, haven't touched that in a long time. Oh. Yeah, Verilog. yeah, yeah. Which That's makes me a terrible, level. terrible programmer. Again, going back to my team, when they look at my code, they're like, why do you unroll everything? Like everything's unrolled. And I'm like, well, it's because in chip design, you don't want to have a lot of like things wrapped up in for loops. You kind of want to see it. this line turns into a circuit. Right. And so that bleeds into my programming. But, you know, I'm always like programming little things. And um, my garage um, is full of all kinds of nerd tools. I have an electron microscope and sputter yes. coders and, oh. and stuff like that. That's but awesome. I digress. I'm like way off in the weeds. <laughs> <laughs> well, and so you mentioned that you're self-taught and you've been in the industry for so long. What got you into the industry in the first place? I think it goes back to when I was a kid. I always dreamed about like making products. I've always been kind of an inventor since I was young. So even before I could make things, I was taking things apart, just trying to understand how they worked, which was extremely frustrating for my father because he'd buy me a <laughs> home computer and I'd have the screws out of it in like <laughs> a few minutes and be looking inside of it or, you know, a new toy. I just dismantle it. And I'd have more fun taking it apart. <laughs> so it always was in the back of my mind that, you know, someday I'm going to be building these things that I'm taking apart. And uh, my career path has been very interesting. So I started off my career at, right out of high school as a professional race car driver, and I actually built the chassis. So these what? are big V8 oh, powered wow, sprint right? cars and uh, late so model cool. cars. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, wow. I ran the I-5 circuit, which was a thing. And and did quite well at that. But I was always an entrepreneur as well. So I would build the cars for other people and sell them. And then in the 90s, I saw a big opportunity. Uh, it was right around 1995. Windows 95 wasn't out yet. And I'm like, wow, there's a lot of margin in building custom computers. And this racing mm -hmm. thing is pretty tough business. So I uh, started a computer store. It's a long story. I won't go into it. It wasn't easy at first because I didn't know anything about you know, 
how to be relatable to customers and stuff like that. But Mm -hmm. I had lots of mentors that helped me along the way. But, you know, some local business owners kind of took me under their wing and taught me how to run a business. And it became quite successful. I had a chain of stores and that was pretty good through the 90s. And then in 2000, the whole computer store market crashed. Mm. You know, year 2000, you know, it was a big hype. We sold a lot of units and everything crashed afterwards. But I'd always been doing hobby electronics and I'd gotten into using these FPGA chips, which FPGAs are you know, the big C of gates in them, ANDs and ORs and XORs and stuff like that yeah. to oversimplify it. But it lets you simulate what a full custom chip can do. And I found that fascinating. I'd been building circuit boards and making little designs with these FPGAs in the 90s. And when my business evaporated, I'm like, you know... I asked like my father and all my friends, what should I do? And they're like, go to school, you know, get get your high school diploma, get your college diploma. (laughs) And I'm like, nah, that's not for me. So I just came to Silicon Valley and started um, meeting entrepreneurs and showing them all my little circuit boards that I built. And after dozens and dozens of interviews, eventually one founder took a chance on me and Um, I took that very serious. I did a really good job for them, worked really hard, worked for $12 an hour. Whoo, I was making the money. (laughs) Um, But it was my chance. Silicon Valley, too. Yeah, in Silicon Valley. And they may have been taking a little advantage of me. But um, that was the stepping stone. And then from there, I did other projects and other projects. And I got a bit of a reputation as like, and I, I had mentors that were teaching me. So I kind of got these this group of advisors and mentors around me that were guiding me through my career path and other engineers that kind of followed me from project to project and we got this reputation as like just get Jerry and her team to solve your tough <laughs> problem and so I've I've circulated awesome. through dozens of startups and I got to I got to see the good and the bad of startups and what to do and what not to do and um, eventually, I ended up at Valve Software. I put together their R and D department. Um, out of that came the HTC Vive, you know, a bunch yeah. of other projects. Oh, yeah, and that's where I got the bug for augmented reality because Gabe Newell, the founder of of Valve, he hired me specifically because he looked at my YouTube channel and he's like, "You've got the right um, perspective on you know how to explore." you know, making hardware for video games. And he says, what I want you to do is bring the family together to play video games because right now you've got hardcore gamers, you've got casual gamers, you've got Mm. gamers that used to be gamers that don't don't play anymore. And then you have non-gamers, you know, find a way to bring them all together. And in fact, part of this technology, I discovered it there and I purchased it from Valve Software because they decided they were just going to go down the VR path, not the augmented reality path. But that's that's like, I fell in love with the idea of bringing families together. Yeah, that is awesome. Gosh. So the, sorry, long winded uh, story, but that's how I got to this point in time where I'm a founder. One. And it's fascinating. But I got to do some really exciting projects over the years. Um, so I worked in the toy industry for five years. That's where I so really fun. cut my teeth and got to work with true, uh, highly disciplined product people and Mm. they taught me like know your audience you know what's the value proposition you're bringing to them you know why are they going to like it and how can you do it um for an economical price and so all that Mm -hmm. built up to you know what helped us make this product i also got to work on exciting products i worked at astra on the low earth orbit rocket that they just launched into Uh space recently and that's so cool. I and I kind of I kind of love that play is serious business for so many companies and stuff too where where yes the ultimate thing is something where it's someone just kind of having fun but it's a very serious business to make it how do we make this a high quality fun experience for everybody and that's that's the coolest thing to see across a career and and all the stuff that you've been That's one of the most valuable things I learned and it it didn't come easy. So when I started working in the toy industry, they approached me and I didn't know anything about, you know, designing a product 
for an end consumer. Like I had done chip designs and all kinds of things just as an engineer. This time I was in charge of designing a product that resonated with a particular audience. The first project they handed to me, they'd already figured that out. So I just executed as just I would as a normal engineer. And it's like, great, we it was a viral hit and things went well. And then they gave me the opportunity to pitch my own toy pro, uh, toy design to them, which I think, oh yeah, I can make a toy that's really fun with you know my ego and everything. And I, I present this <laughs> toy to them, which is like a super nerds toy. All of us would love it. It just had lights and displays and sound and you know, and they, these executives took one look at it and they're like, they just reamed me out. And I was wow. almost in tears, like oh. when I was pitching them this toy, cause they were so harsh on me. And then afterwards they cornered me in the hall and they're like, you know, sorry, we were so hard on you, but you need to understand, you know, next time you pitch a product, you need to come in, tell us your audience, why they're going to love it you know, unit economics, and they just taught yeah. me all these pieces. And uh, um, a lot of times as an engineer, you don't have to think about that because maybe your right. readership's already figured that out for you. You just but, build. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. and the toy industry is very much like a startup, right? It's mm -hmm. the toy industry, the design cycle is one year. Uh, you're expected as a product owner to understand your audience. You need to like, condense it down to the bare minimum, you know, just ditch everything that's not adding fun to it, which is um, an interesting challenge. I love it. All right. I'm moving us on to rapid fire questions. Ah. Okay. We're going to be asking you questions rapidly. <laughs> and the first one is we all have project ideas that we're squatting on. What's, what's one of yours? Personal or professional? Ooh, both. Either one. Oh, okay. Well, obviously a second gen uh, version of our product. I was alluding to that. Of I course. have so, so <laughs> many ideas and I can't act on them right now. Like right. We, we have such a good product now that, um, you know, we can market for like a year and a half or two years. So, you know, I have to like hold back from um, mm. spinning up people to work on it or even to work on it myself when I should be out like fundraising or doing some of these <laughs> other activities. Um, I have so many personal projects. So uh, I alluded to my garage. So my garage is like a nerd's playground. Um, a oh. few years ago, I set up an entire chip foundry in there. So I've been slowly but not quickly working on a, um, a full process to make pretty complicated chips in my garage. And I have an idea mm -hmm. in mind of what I want to reproduce. It's some retro technology. I'm, if you go look at my background, I'm always doing retro tech kind of stuff. That's so cool. So I have a super secret retro chip project I want to do. It may take me a decade to get there someday though, but I've been slowly <laughs> gathering all the tools. It, if, my landlord came over and looked in the garage. They would be convinced I have a meth lab going because it does not look like what normal people have in the garage. Yeah, well, just because there's so many specific parts for making chips, so I can only imagine the piles. <laughs> yeah, I've done some very simple chips. I, I did that maybe 10 years ago on my YouTube channel, but I want to take it to the next level. Yeah. Thanks. All right, what is the most recent thing you over-optimized? <laughs> Pretty much it's always everything. good when the answer to that is a laugh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, that's a great question. I oh, always over optimize things. Well, um, actually, the the circuit board that's in our headset, I I did the entire design mm -hmm. on this, and you know, coming from the toy industry, they don't let you use circuit boards that have, you know a ton of layers in it. And we mm. use really complicated chips in here that have a lot of pins on them. So normally you have to go as high as 12 layers. And I was obsessed. I'm like, it's going to be six layers, no more than six layers. I have a price point in mind. We're going to hit it. And this design is such a kind of, can I say mine? <laughs> it's <laughs> uh, <laughs> bleep. Uh, but uh, 
it was so hard to do to do in six layers because oh, you sure. know you have these complicated chips and you have to get the wires out from underneath them so mm. it took so many hours to like untangle these wires and get them out from these chips and i'm super proud of it but i probably just time to market i probably should have just went to more layers but it's so cool that you it's didn't so have cool to. Yeah. i have such nerd cred <laughs> with my peers <laughs> when I show them and they look at it I'm like and it's six layers <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome what's your golden rule for hardware design or just working in general don't over optimize everything <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> fair, fair. no Walk no I, I mean that's kind of true it's like it's so easy as an engineer to get excited about the latest technology. I think my golden rule is look at, can you do this with commodity components and mm. do that? Um, Cause you can get in real trouble in hardware engineering. If you get too exotic and our whole product is designed around this, it's like um, everything's plastic, including the lenses, the circuit board is six layers right so it's an easy process to build it's very commodity as we selected components you know we might have been able to go a little faster designing it if we use some fancy chips that do a lot more but instead we chose like simpler parts that you can get 20 variants that all plug into the same place and again that comes back to like the toy industry it's like they never want to be stuck with a single supplier of anything i think that also yeah. applies to you know you know other aspects of the business as well it really it applies to so many different things because if you go too custom on something uh, it gets harder to debug because it's so mm -hmm. custom or or mm -hmm. if you end yeah. up getting something that's too many dependencies then you have a whole dependency chain to update to fix something yeah it saved our bacon in quite a few times i mean we may not have been in production now um uh, with some of the things we were able to change really quickly. Like you think that your design at prototype stage is good. And then you built the first couple thousand and you're like, Ooh, we're seeing, mm. you know, out in the field, people are having trouble with USB and it's like, Oh, mm. well, we'll yeah, change a capacitor here. And because it wasn't like fully integrated, we have that flexibility to change a small component to improve the quality of the product. What is your favorite? It depends question. Oh, I think I just went through some of those. It depends. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Sometimes people look at my um, journey and mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, it's like a hero's journey, like drop out of high school, get into racing, brute force my way into, you know, different fields and learn it all myself. Um, for some people, that's a really good direction, you know, to go. I'm mm -hmm. always been kind of non-traditional in the way I think about things and do things. And so very rigid schooling never really resonated with me, you know, but it depends. It depends on your personality, right? You know, right. some people are better served to like, you know, have a more rigorous path. Um, it definitely hasn't been easy. So I don't recommend it unless you have a personality like me. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. Uh, what is the oldest piece of tech that you still own? Well, that's a great question. Also, uh, I don't know. I love retro tech, so I have a lot of old stuff. So our office is set up like a museum. There's glass cases all around the office that's so with uh, old technology in it. So I have retro computers going back to the 70s, Ataris, Apple IIs, things like that. More modern stuff from the 90s and 2000s. And I love to set up our office where there's a failed product and a successful product sitting right next to each other. Mm. Um, so you can look at the trade-offs. So as you talk yeah. to engineers, like this one was successful because they did this and this one failed because they did that. And so there's a lot of old tech around the office, which is a lot of my personal collection, but I also have like vintage video gear here. Um, it goes clear <gasps> back so to fun. the sixties. Uh -huh. I have a reel to reel video recorder, the first consumer, camcorder which we actually wear the recorder as this giant apparatus and then you hold this yeah. black and white camera up but i mean possibly um you know, this might be one of the oldest pieces i have in the office 
So this is a core memory stack from a CDC mainframe. So this is core Whoa. memory. Oh. I don't remember Dang. how many bits of memory it is, but I can see down in there the cores are really big. So this is just probably the icon to launch your web browser on your desktop has more storage than this. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, I absolutely love wow. having this old tech around because... Uh, there's been so many times in my career because I study the history of computers and electronics that you're tempted to go down one path to design something. And then you think like, wait a minute, in the 1960s, they used this, a transformer to do this complicated task instead of like an integrated circuit. And for our problem that solves it and it's way cheaper or faster or... And it's super valuable not to forget about the past. Yeah. And then I okay. collect pinball machines. I have some pretty old pinball machines. Too. That's really cool. Oh, that's really cool. So that's our office cool is loaded with pinball <laughs> machines. And so I it's it's hard to machines. say what my oldest piece of tech is. Man, I think hearing more about your office, it's kind of like maybe I do want to go back to come the by, office. Come by, come by. People love. <laughs> <laughs> we we do a, a happy hour every two or three weeks on Fridays. So, oh, so we try fun. to in, oh, invite the nerdiest people we can find. So of there's course. always people bringing Love their that. kind of nerdy projects in and we hang out, <laughs> eat beer that and awesome. or drink beer and eat pizza. That's Love so that. cool. Well, what is your favorite hardware pun? A pun or can it be a joke? Ooh, a joke. It can be a joke too. Yeah. Uh, this is terrible, but I think this sums up my 20 years uh, working in companies that have a strong software and hardware aspect to it. Um, how many programmers does it take to screw in a light bulb? None. Oh. It's a hardware problem. Hey. Oh. hey oh. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's the dilemma <laughs> in hardware startups where... Um, there's always this finger pointing, like right. the product's not <laughs> yes. working and it's software. No, it's hardware. And uh, it's one of those barriers you have to break down. Yeah, it's a very good lesson in communication across teams. I'm oh, sure. yeah. 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 <laughs> and last but not least, what's your most used emoji? Probably smiley face. I don't like using all the other. All the others. Or maybe the ones. celebration one, you know. That's uh, a that's a classic. That's a, that's a fun one. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, we we use chat a lot in in work because we're probably sixty to seventy percent of our company is remote. So mm -hmm. you know, it's things are really lost in chat, and I hate that about it. Right. So yeah, I try not yeah. to use the frowny one, so it's not misinterpreted as like, am I frowning at? the personnel or am I pr frowning at the situation or the statement <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. 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 yeah it's, emoji are definitely like both helpful in that, but also is like, wait, is that a passive aggressive smiley face? And yeah. <laughs> uh, so many of those. <laughs> the dynamics of it. Okay. And now it is time for the random segment generator. Ah. Okay, so now it is time for some random segments. And this first one is Dev Oops. What's the story of something that you broke? Oh, God. <laughs> 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 uh, broke? Oh, my goodness. That is so hard because, you know, part of hardware design is you try to build and break it as fast as possible. So, right. mm. and, uh, in hardware, the lead time to fix things is so long. Um, mm. You want to have your most catastrophic failures early on and as quickly as possible. Yep. So I think probably the one that had the most potential to cost the most money was I was designing a chip for a toy and um, the synthesis tools output a log and it spews lots of stuff and you, you're you're crunching at the last you know moments before you're at final tape out of the chip and you're like ah oh, it was fine the time before so i'm just gonna submit the net list and i did that and so we were so behind schedule we had to do what was called a super hot lot on the the chips so you just run 
all the wafers through and you don't do any prototypes of it. You just send them oh. through <laughs> like oh. millions of dollars of chips. And my confidence was pretty high this thing was going to work. But um, anyway, the chips landed at the factory in China. They bonded them onto the board. This is chip on board. So it's um, it's a little trickier than having like packaged chips that you can then analyze. So it's now under a glob of epoxy. And they fire up the first 100 units and 50% of them don't start. Oh, no. And it's like you can't ship a product like that if only 50% of them start. And, of course, these executives in the toy company, they're intense. Like they're, you know, when you mess up, the hammer comes down and rightfully so. And I like that about it. But I had screwed up big time. And so they put me on a plane to go over to to China to figure this out. And I'm over there in a in a foreign lab, you know, without my tools trying to figure this out. And what had happened is I didn't read my logs close enough and I'd forgot to reset one of the flip flops in the uh, design. Oh no. And so Uh. chips, when you flip flop is what stores a one or a zero for folks that don't know. And so this particular um, chip had a a video controller in it. And what this flip flop did is chose one mode versus another. And so when you, produce chips, there's variance between um, each of the chips, just they're baked like cookies. They're all a little bit different. And so 50% of them would start up with a zero in this uh, oh. bit and some would start with a one. So 50% Gosh. of them were in the wrong video mode and um, uh-huh. was causing everything to lock up. Also on this design, because toy designs are so cost sensitive, you don't, um, you don't uh, use flash memory. It's too expensive. So you do mask ROMs or you do one-time programmable. So they'd already made hundreds of thousands of these ROM chips for it that we'd tested on a, like a an FPGA emulator. So we were highly confident it would work. So we couldn't even get in there to fix the, the software to kind of, you know, Dang. try to get around this. So what I ended up doing is I'm like, crap, what, do, what can I do? And I'm like, there is these weird test pins that, you know, uh, you use for testing the chips before you um, cut them up off the die. And usually uh, those are resetting the um, the state of these flip flops through a secondary channel. I'm like, maybe I'm going to get lucky enough that that particular chip, if you toggle the test mode, it's going to reset it back to zero or one or whatever it needed to be. And I got yeah. extremely lucky. So whew, I was able <laughs> yeah, to like, I got a little sweaty thinking about that. Yeah. <laughs> I was, uh, I was able to like add like two little, like two cent components outside the, the part that would just toggle this pin and get that. But I could have lost that company millions of dollars. And oh God, that oh, was wow. a colossal oops. Whew. Whew. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'll tell you, the, the toy guys don't get um, are not happy if you come back and say you lost them a couple million dollars. Yeah. I'd, I'd say a few I'm, people might be yeah. upset with news yeah. like that. But glad you got through that. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't think I've ever had any like completely fatal oopses um, on a product. That isn't gonna knock on some wood there. Yeah. yeah. That one. <laughs> All right, moving on to the next segment, we've got Dev Opposites. Mm-hmm. So we've got a few questions here. What do you do outside of your day job and, you know, non-tech hobbies? Oh, my goodness. I am such a nerd through and through. Most of my hobbies are nerdy. I guess um, Understandable. I can yeah. talk about a few things that I did that are pretty interesting. I played roller derby for quite a few years. That was oh, fun. Cool. Oh, cool. Yeah, knocking people down and skating really fast. So that yeah, was fun. I'm terrified of roller derby people. I, I went to one <laughs> bout and I was like, oh, they can all beat me up. <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing is I was like the smallest girl there. So it's like, um, so I had to learn little tricks to be able to knock down the bigger girls because some of them are mm-hmm. intimidating. I can't remember what her name was, but she was she was the daughter of a, a football player, like a professional football player. And she was big. And when she made contact, you went flying. Um, but more recently, I think, you know, completely non-nerdy thing is I, I like to go out in the desert and ride a, 
ride dirt bar- bikes. Yeah, that kind of goes. Oh, cool. Goes back cool. to my racing days and thrill seeking. So occasionally I'll go do that. Yeah. If you weren't in the tech industry at all, what would you be doing? Would it be racing stuff or something else, do you think? I think I'd be in education. Mm. Huh. Yeah, yeah. I I appreciate all the mentors that took me under their wing and I try to give back as much as I can. I have a YouTube channel where I do educational videos like how to do difficult science things in your garage and and I get a lot of satisfaction out of that. Yeah. Love that. I feel the exact same way. It's 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 fun seeing people take what you teach and then they run with it and, mm-hmm. and make it their own. It's really humbling. You know, I did my YouTube channel and I just kind of put it out into the universe. If someone likes it, they like it. If not, and uh, I've been doing this for quite a long time. I haven't done videos in a while because I've been so busy, but um, I get emails every single week of people like, I appreciate what you said or did here. And there's certain young folks that found my YouTube channel that I've been following over the years that got inspired and then went on to do engineering or other things in their life. And they occasionally drop me a note and say like, because I saw this video, it inspired me to go do this other thing. I love that. that. Feels good. That's so cool. All right. And our final segment is 404s and heartbreak. What's something that was taken off of the internet. There's a page not found doesn't exist anymore. It breaks your heart. Geo cities. Mm. Uh, Good mm. one. <laughs> Good one. Mm. Yeah. Classic. I don't know. I'm a nostalgia nerd, so there's just something charming about ten thousand animated gifts that Yes. Yeah. Such good stuff. And I think on that note, for Cassidy's sage advice. Something that I really want to advise anybody out there is to really just appreciate the history of the tech that you're building. Because a lot of times you could be frustrated with the state of web development or the the state of how to build X, Y, and Z, whether it's a hardware project, a software project. But a lot of times when you look back to see where we came from, you not only are humbled by all of the work that it used to take and or how hard it was to learn back then, but you can also learn from it too. And maybe you'll find a solution that you hadn't considered before because it might be an older one. That being said, Jerry, thank you so much for joining us. Thank it was you. awesome. Thank you. Yes, thank you. It was so fun. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, where can people find you on the internet? Anything you oh, want to Oh, yeah. Um, so if you want to go check out our product, uh, Tilt5.com. It's just all spelled out. It's Inside Joke, our name. Um, And then uh, to find me on all social media that I participate in, don't do Facebook, Spatui, um, it's Jerry (laughs) Ellsworth, J-E-R-I, and then Ellsworth. Awesome. And once again, because making podcasts is expensive, this show is brought to you by Launch Darkly. Launch Darkly toggles peaks of 20 trillion feature flags each day, and that number continues to grow, and you should use them. You can head over to launchdarkly.com and learn about how. Thank you for making this show possible, Launch Darkly. I've been Cassidy Williams. You can find me at Cassidoo, C-A-S-S-I-D-O-O, on most things, and I'm CTO over at Contenda. And I'm Zach. And I'm a DevRel at Arrive, and you can find me on Twitter at Zach Plata. Thank you for tuning into the Dev Morning Show at night. Make sure you head over to our YouTube channel where you can like and subscribe. You can also listen to the audio version of this wherever you get your podcasts. 